Welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a very British perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be reasonably normal. We do this one topic at a time. We are Jeffrey Campos, that's me, an engineer and devil's advocate, and Benjamin de Campos, a designer and believer. We generally choose a topic of interest, uh, something that we think we need to know a little bit more about. Uh, we spend some time researching it, and then we have a discussion and we publish the notes. The notes are available on our webpage, eclecticist.co.uk. Uh, you can read along while we discuss the topic. We think that the benefit of doing this is that we learn a little bit more about the topics that we select or are selected for us, and hopefully we achieve a greater understanding and we cultivate further discussion in the community, you, our listeners. The topic we're struggling with this time around is robots. We're living in an age where otherwise normal people prefer to deftly caress glowing rectangles than exchange more than a few sentences with their kin. We're locked in our homes, cosseted with the convenience of online purchasing and large screen televisions. Technology seductively iterates in an ever-tightening stranglehold. The tremor in a surgeon's hand, a customer service representative's botched order, palliative bathroom duties, the writing's on the wall for human labor. It is only a matter of time where, from the shoulders of giants, we summon the machines that will ultimately replace us. Are we soon to relinquish control of our own destiny? Is this the time of peak human? We are not going to be discussing Novaya Zemla Archipelago at the top of Russia, that place where they dropped that really big bomb. So, robots. Uh, the word robot, I was interested to discover, was originally coined by Isaac Asimov himself uh, sometime in the 1950s. Uh, he defined it as a, uh, his definition is the Oxford Dictionaries.com definition, which is a machine capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically, especially one programmed by a computer. So I think that's a quite a, a wide definition of what a robot is. I mean, you know, by that definition, I suppose, you know, a, a computer printer is a robot because it is programmed by a computer and it carries out an automated action. Uh, to achieve a result. So we really are surrounded by robots. I mean, all technology is pretty much robotic these days. So is, that, is it really only since the 1950s that the word robot has been in use? As I discovered, yes. Isaac Asimov, the father of robotics and the author of the three robot laws, which we'll get to, uh, yeah, he uh, originally coined it and it was you know, published in one of his many stories. But... Uh, I mean, I always thought a robot was something, I don't know why, but I always thought a robot was something physical that usually had appendages, you know, whether or not it was a, a packing robot with robotic arms that's just swiveling on a plinth or an actual bipedal, you know, anthrop anthropomorphized machine, which, you know, vaguely looks humanoid. But of course it doesn't have to be humanoid. I can imagine most well-designed robots probably wouldn't be humanoid because it's not the most efficient shape. Uh, so, you know, I think there are lots of different sorts of robots out yes, there. Yes, but, but they all speak like Stephen Hawking. Well, uh, yes. I mean, I haven't heard that these days. I mean, I remember when robotic speech and computer speech was big and you had loads of computer programs that would try to read text um, automatically. And I thought, you know, it was all really exciting there for a while. And then it sort of died out and no one really cared about robots reading text. For instance, the first Kindle I owned, the Amazon Kindle e-reader, it was able to read the text out loud to you. Uh, but they since got rid of that function and the headphone jack and the ability to play MP3s. And, you know, they've really dumbed it down. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my phone, uh, it's a Blackberry and Blackberries have a built-in text-to-speech reader. Uh, which is which is very good. Um, I never use it, but it is very good. Um, so speech, I don't know. I don't really think about that in computers at the same time. No, it's time definitely anymore. a thing. It's still a thing, and it's definitely a lot better than it was because it's Siri on my phone, which I keep forgetting to use. But every time I just try it out, it's always pretty impressive. This it's impressive in terms of speaking back to me, but also its own speech rec recognition is fairly impressive. Yeah, definitely, speech recognition has come along as we were talking about earlier. 
um, the Amazon box, the Fire box, has a, a speech recognition system which is amazingly accurate, and the new Apple TV is incredibly accurate, and all modern mobile phones, the Google Androids uh, and the Apple phones have amazing speech recognition. It's getting better and better and better in a frightening kind of way because I think they send your your voice to their server farms. So you're actually making a call to Apple's server farm and they're analyzing you know, with supercomputers and they're sending back the information. So I don't think it works offline, basically. Um, so that's kind of weird. Yeah, I was reading up on the history of robots and uh, way back in 1969, there was a, uh, a robot... Um, a study uh, where they built a robotic hand and it's just a robotic arm rather and all it could do is place blocks so it could lift uh, target and then grasp and li- lift and then place uh, little wooden blocks and it used this crazy 3D scanner sort of um, camera array to try and help it target it, it, you know the, the blocks to grab um this was in scotland the uh the department of machine intelligence in edinburgh in 1969 it ran all the way to 1976 it was called freddy freddy one and freddy two and you know way back then you imagine the state of state of the art with technology it was fairly limited but what they had in mind was you know contemporary that what they're trying to do is they're, they're trying to get a robot to automatically perform tasks without having to be precisely controlled. So the idea is to get away from having to have a a human controlling the machine. Rather, you want to give the machine instructions, take all of the red blocks and stack them in a pile over here. And then you don't have to then drive the hand to grasp each individual red block. It can just do it. And you want to be, you want to sort of, you know, keep stepping back with the number of instructions you need to give to the machines to the point where they just do it by themselves <laughs> and they know to do it and they just do it. That's the ultimate goal. I think we no longer have to instruct. They just provide whatever service it is that we require. But uh, way back in 1969, you know, they, they, they started, they started on the journey and uh, a lot of uh, progress have been made since, of course. Yes. You mentioned in your uh, little opening polemic about, um, let me just read this. What did you say? The writings on the wall for human labor. Yes. I also heard Sam Harris say something like this in his one of his recent podcasts where he's talking about machines will basically free us up to run around and play Frisbee. And <laughs> I think he actually said play Frisbee as if this is going to be such a wonderful world because all of the robots will be doing all these you know, brainless, menial tasks that we currently employ people to do. So how does this work then? Because all of the people in the world who aren't sort of, haven't had the right opportunities or aren't smart enough to do anything other than stack things or put things in boxes or you know, work on some production line in a factory so what's going to happen to them so this is this is basically the threat or the perceived threat of technological unemployment where machines uh, or robots will gradually take over all human activities in the in the world of work starting with the sort of lower grade labor uh intensive um repetitive tasks so factory jobs and packing things moving things around, sorting things, uh, all of these things you would automatically assume would be more suited to a computer. Uh, For instance, um, every time I go into a coffee shop, and I'm sure I've mentioned this before in previous shows, but every time I visit a coffee shop, I'll place an order and it will always be wrong. Whatever I order, they'll forget something or just, you know, human brains aren't able to remember that much at any particular moment in time, especially sort of transient knowledge like an order, uh, whereas a computer simply wouldn't make that mistake. And there's a famous, um, a famous robot that works in the Honda car factory, and it will come to your table in the refectory and ask, take a drinks order. It'll ask for your drinks order. And the workers at the Honda factory have become used to just blurting out their order over each other. So if there are four people, they'll all speak their drinks request at the same time. 
and the robot is able to hear all of their orders and know which person ordered what because it can hear everything at the same time. It doesn't need to wait there, wait for everybody to say what their order is in turn. So a, a very clear, basic uh, efficiency gain there. Um, and robots in the service industry, you know, they wouldn't make mistakes all the time. Uh, they, they would just simply be more efficient. And what they're trying to do is just trying to recognize what it is you're ordering and then go and get the order. It's so obviously robotic that we want those sorts of jobs to disappear to, to robots. You know, there are so many jobs, if not all jobs, we really would rather not do and have robots do them for us. And I think we're getting to a point where that's going to start happening. And I think we're just waiting for, you know... A, a more visible industry to start adopting them large scale. Because, of course, there are lots of robots and lots of industries. And again, I think of car manufacture, where you can you can get to entire sections of the production line, uh, which there are no humans. <laughs> it's all robotic arms doing the point welding and all assembly and all the rest of it. And I, I don't see why that we just can't start rolling that sort of thing out. Okay. Uh, well, you haven't answered my question. What's going to happen to the people who currently have those jobs? Are we, are we just going to kill them all? Well, no. The idea is, I mean, like like a sort of um, a free market capitalist argument, you know, it's trickle-down economics. Uh, you know, you'll get a few people who are doing extraordinarily, stratospherically well, and everybody benefits. You know, the, the tide raises all boats. And uh, the people who are made unemployed by having their jobs taken by robots you know if, if that happens they'll they'll simply new opportunities will become available and they'll need to move laterally perhaps that's not really an answer <laughs> yeah that, that, again you know not everyone sort of has um well for example not everyone has that much to give you know there are people that simply all they can do is you know sit sort of you know, barely functioning, their brain shut down, and they're just stacking blocks in a, you know, on a production line in some factory somewhere. Well, I think that you can you can turn it around and say, well, you know, should should we hold back progress for these people? I mean, should 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 everybody in the race slow down to the slowest person so everybody can pass the finish line <laughs> at the same time? Well, no. So you know. Life's, so life's not so life's what? tough. Life's not fair, <laughs> and, and it will be a case of tough. And you know, there's a, a heightened competition for the the remaining jobs, and perhaps there will be more leisure time. You know, it, it depends right. how how free and open the market is for robotics entering the 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 world of employment. No, but you see what's happening. It's like th there's this unavoidable sort of ethical conundrum, which is sort of part of this. It's like, yes, this technology is proliferating. You know, you can't do anything about that. But then suddenly, what kind of revolution are you going to have on the streets? Are you going to suddenly have, you know, vast swathes of people um, who are just out marauding and, you know, killing people because they don't have anything else to do? They feel so disenfranchised and all of this kind of thing. You know, it sounds like a science fiction film, a, a, a dystopic science fiction film. Yeah, but at the same time, if we have large-scale robotic employment, um, people will or perhaps have more leisure time. And also, the incredible cost savings and efficiency gains of robots in the workplace would mean costs uh, costs for everything would go down and prices would go down and perhaps people only need to work a couple of days a week to to support themselves because you know we we don't have to pay unions we don't have to pay healthcare costs you know everything everything becomes more affordable i don't know if that even sounds like a good idea to me because i mean not everyone likes to have that much free time you know work can be a blessed relief for a lot of people you know their lives might be so dead outside of work and then suddenly they're forced to be out of work then what do they do is it any wonder that we hear stories about people who you know turn to all sorts of crazy vices when they have just too much time on their hands well it depends what leisure activities are made available I and mean, if there's a, if there's a higher demand for leisure activities then you know that demand in a free market will be met and who knows people can completely lose themselves in virtual reality universes or gaming or who knows i think you know people given the time and given the uh, the resources and opportunities, I think, can can find their lives renewed and and follow completely new and and different 
pursuits. So if I'm following this correctly, so you would have no problem sending millions and millions of people to their deaths? Well, I think it would be a gradual sort of um, infiltration of robotics in the workplace. And I think rather than kicking people out of jobs, it would just close off job opportunities that, you know, that were there in the past and that are are no longer here in the future, Mm. as it were. So, you know, whereas before you could perhaps get a job stocking shelves um you know a couple of years from now that job simply won't exist anymore so you won't look for that job so you know that's the way it'll happen it'll happen slowly and it'll happen reasonably well it's interesting there's an interesting parallel here i was listening to a man on the radio who is a gentleman of color and you hear uh, a lot of is that joseph joseph and his uh technical yes raincoat? a gentleman of okay. colorful raincoats um, should we explain that for our listeners who don't know what the hell we're talking about? No, it was, you know how you, um, there's like this stereotype of a racist white person who will say something like, oh, the problem with these foreigners or these people who aren't white is they come here and they take our jobs. And generally, we, we don't listen to that. You know, if we're of a sensible mindset, if we hear a white person say that, we'll just marginalize them, um, write them off as just being, you know, they're just like a, a racist sod. But this is a person of color. This is a black man who was talking on the radio. And he had a little bit more sort of authority with talking about how um, it's the Hispanics that have taken all the black people's jobs. And he was talking about the film from the 1970s, Car Wash. You know, I think Richard Pryor's in it, a few other people. You know the one. Yeah. And he says, you know, this Car Wash and wherever it was and, you know... Um, some part of Los Angeles, and it's like every person who worked at this car wash was a black person. Now, if you go to you know a similar setup these days, every person who works at the car wash will be Hispanic. And he's saying the reason why there's so much black on black crime is because black people have been disenfranchised because all these really um, menial jobs are now gone, and so they don't have anything to do. So this is kind of like what you're talking about, but maybe on an even larger scale. Oh, no, they've been disenfranchised because they've been outcompeted, perhaps. By, by the sounds of it, of what you're saying, is that they've, they've been replaced by people who are perhaps better at performing the tasks or cheaper, or both. That's exactly what you're talking about, though, because these machines are going to outperform people because they're better and they're cheaper. Yes, they absolutely will. But, but <laughs> what they will also do is drive down costs. Whereas hiring humans to do tasks is costly in lots of ways. But hi- hiring robots, you know, the, the gains are potentially immense. They can work faster. They can work 24-7. Uh, you don't need to worry about health care. You know, I mean, really, we're talking major leaps in uh, return on investment, potentially. Yeah, but you say that. But I, th- I think it would be a while before you'd see any return on investment because when you take into consideration all the insane R&D, you know, just how much these machines are going to cost to actually engineer and then to build, it's going to be like putting, um, uh, you know, solar panels on your roof. It's like you have to wait like 10 years before you actually start seeing any benefits of that. I, I think there's a scale of economy argument there because I think the research and development that you purchaser needs to invest in is you know we again we stand on the shoulders of giants and that that r&d has been done the technology is available it's consumer level now and it's off the shelf and because these are multi-purpose computer programs that we're building uh i think um that that, that's no longer the case you know you can you can just buy a general purpose robot and tweak it a little bit and that's it it's performing the function that you need it to perform in your particular industry um so I think it's uh, it's um, uh, a technological snowball that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's going to be extremely hard to ignore, uh, you know, even in the near future. And we can see this in cars. You know, we can see that cars, which have you know notoriously always had extremely long R and D um, periods uh, before production and sale, uh, that's contracting considerably. I mean, I remember when. You know, you, you if, if you, ha- you bought a new car, the electronics in the new car would be outdated because consumer electronics was progressing at you know a, a, a pace that was a, a scale of magnitude quicker than the uh, car manufacturers. But now that the tech sector is getting into car manufacture, then I think we're going to see a massive change in in the pace of technological progression with cars uh, because that that 
problem has been solved. <laughs> and I think that's going to happen everywhere. I mean, you know, you can see that people are playing with these little drones and that um, businesses are thinking about using drones. Farmers are using drones. When I say drones, I mean these remotely piloted vehicles, these little um, usually battery-powered rotor blade devices that fly about in the air with cameras on them usually. Uh, you can immediately see the utility of these devices. You can see that it's really handy for a farmer to be able to throw one of these things in the air and instantly look at his his acreage and see any problems, check the weather, you know, zoom in on potential issues, fences that need to be repaired, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, rather than driving around in a truck around his property for a couple of hours. Um, and now they're thinking of using these drones to deliver for deliveries. Uh, they're thinking of using them for delivering med- um, uh, blood and uh, human organs, you know, because they're quicker. They can fly as the crow flies uh, to, you know, wherever they need to go. And uh, it's just, it's the incredible potential for efficiency gains. That's what robotics is all about. And someone once said that software is uh, eating the world. Um, I, I've written that down in the notes here, whoever. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It, it was Mark, Mark Anderson, Anderson in 2011. He said, in short, in short, software is eating the world. So it's the programming. The programming that goes into these robotics is just as important as the actual hardware development of the you know the robotic limbs and the 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 tendons and the uh, servo motors and the battery capabilities and all the rest of it and all of it's coming along at such a great pace that uh you know really it's it's the applications that are that are screaming out now for uh for this revolution and i just always think about mcdonald's i just think mcdonald's you could automate a mcdonald's ref- restaurant completely and get rid of the you know the huge number of people behind the counter uh, surely you can do that. But I always think the problem there is the governments just won't allow it. Governments know that so many people are employed at McDonald's that if McDonald's were to turn around as a private company and choose to automate their kitchens, they could. They could do it and they want to do it, but they're being prevented from doing it because of exactly the problem that people perceive with uh, unemployment. And I think this is an issue. Yeah, you and I have spoken about this before. Um, and we just disagree on this. I prefer to be served by a human than to be served by a vending machine. I, I prefer to get what I ordered and I prefer it to be the best prepared food or product that could possibly be prepared. And I prefer not to get food poisoning and I prefer to know that nobody has tampered with my food. Especially that guy over there with the really hairy Yeah, hands. but it's all part of um, you know living on the edge. You know, kind of spices up our life to have to worry about getting food poisoned. Um, but I have a feeling, I've got no data to support this, but I wouldn't be surprised if my view is the one that's shared by the general public more than yours. I think people like to see other people. People like that social interaction. You know, people like a smile. That's a separate argument. I like to see other it's people not as a well. Argument. But there, there, there are not cer- a separate argument. No, but there are certain times and places and um, tasks where... I don't really need to see that other person. I like to see other people in social engagements and, you know, but... When, I, when I'm doing meat and potatoes tasks that I do every single day, I just want it to be right. I want it to be not a hassle. And I just want to get my food. And also, um, you know, I, I think when I'm, you know, hopefully 95 years old and uh, I need somebody or something or, or at least I need my bum to be wiped, I don't want it to be a person. I would prefer it to be me. But if I'm incapable of doing it, I would rather it wasn't another human. I would rather it was a machine that was doing it. Yeah, Jeff, but there's two different things there. I mean, you're talking about having your bum wiped and talking about going to McDonald's or going to some restaurant or something. Yeah, I I agree. I I don't want a human to wipe my bum. I'd rather no one knows about my bum. But (laughs) going and buying a coffee or buying a burger or whatever, yeah, yeah, I want to see a human. Hello, how are you doing? Thank you. Yeah, no, I I don't. Yeah, and you reason, don't. Yeah, the but reason why, hang on, reason hang why on, I don't because I'm uncomfortable doing it. Okay, Jeff, fine. That's you, and I think you are an anomaly. I think most people like to see humans. And I think, like, for example, like if it, a day I get up, go to work, you know, I stare at my screen at lunchtime. You know, I don't want to go to another machine and get my food and then go back staring at my screen and then go home the whole day and having no interaction with another human. Okay, let, 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 me, let me put it to you like this. I think most people want to go and interact with other people. I agree. But I think people would 
prefer to have what they ordered correct and in perfect working order. That's what I think. So given, given the choice, I think people would opt for, yes, I'd rather have everything I ordered absolutely perfect, the best it could possibly be, and really cheaply and super quick. They would go for that over having to talk to somebody who's going to screw up their order and you're going to have to wait for ages and they're going to have to say, oh, oh, remember me? I ordered this, but you forgot. I think you've kind of straw manned that a little bit. I mean, how often do you get your orders screwed up? You make it sound like it's every time you order something. Almost every time. Okay, well, I think you're just unlucky. Uh, yeah, and I would prefer not to be unlucky. I would prefer to have a machine give me the exact thing that I ordered every single I think time. It would be, I think it would be interesting just to roll this out. In fact, this has to have already happened. In fact, I have some vague memory that McDonald's did do some kind of automated system. But I think, you know, we should roll it out and see who goes where and see how po- popular it is. Abs- that's that's ex- that's exactly what should happen. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it should happen. We should have at least one. I mean, there there's a famous restaurant in Germany, I think, that is automated. It does have robots, but it's it's sort of, you know, hipstery, art housey, and it's not on an industrial scale or anything. But I think, you know, there's an awful... I mean, obviously, if we take McDonald's as the example here, there is already a heck of a lot of robotic automation in the kitchens. I mean, you know, the whole the whole business model of McDonald's is robotic you know it's so cookie cutter you know every single restaurant you know, there's so many rules and everything it's a machine that they've built but it's just that it's serviced by humans and i think that's the point where they you know we need to change that and get it serviced by machines and and much fewer uh, uh humans in the equation you know get rid of 90 percent of the people operating one of the restaurants and get the machines in because again i would really look forward to things like hermetically sealed kitchens you know absolutely free of any bacteria or anything i mean just absolutely perfect because god knows how many minor infections we get from from uh, fast food vendors and you know any sort of restaurant environment it's inevitable somebody's sneezing on your food you know it's inevitable that their skin cells are falling into your food it's absolutely happens so, we're, you know, we could, every little cough that we have and every little ailment that we have and every little sickness, maybe that's because we're being poisoned every day by having food prepared in restaurants by humans that we don't know from lots of, you know, multiple ethical, ethnic backgrounds, you know, who may have brought pathogens in from other lands. Um, I just think if if we could increase all of the good things, the the taste, the... The um, cleanliness, the efficiency, I think all of that can be achieved through automation. And that automation would be in the form of general purpose robotic devices. I think it'd be great. And you could still have a few people. I mean, perhaps maybe we keep the humans on the front line, but in the back room, in the kitchen, it is truly just a single machine making all of the food. Why have humans, you know, why have humans making the burgers? All the burgers are, are the same. It's crazy to have any humans doing such a repetitive job. Yeah. So I think that's the way it'll happen. The robots will come in and do all the really super mega repetitive jobs where you want to increase yield, reduce waste, and, you know, just get the general customer satisfaction hit rate up. Although, I mean, there are some maybe little chinks in your argument here um, because, I mean, I don't know, but you hear all these stories about people when they're sort of completely sheltered from any type of infection that their immune system suffers and they have all sorts of problems in life asthma etc yeah i'm not i'm not saying we're hermetically sealing our bodies right. just in restaurants everywhere else fine you go outside of course you're going to be in contact with lots of little um lots of uh, little bugs to exercise your immune system but uh what i don't want is some sort of influenza virus in my pizza that's what I don't want. Or fingernails. Or hairs. I just, you know, we're, we're, I think we're really going to become very squeamish with all of that sort of thing. I think our squeam factor is probably going to play into this automation game as well. Because, you know, it's it's inevitable that we're going to become effectively vegans as an entire species. You know, we're going to just, you know, hundreds of years from now, we'll look back and think, oh my god, you ate animals. You know, oh my god, you had dairy products. You actually ate the milk the baby milk from other living creatures, you disgusting barbarians. All of that is going to happen. And I think 
we we will also become socially squeamish. You know, we won't want to deal with anybody with a a really hyper repetitive job that they're very clearly not happy with. Uh, we just <laughs> will be too squeamish to do it and too uncomfortable. Um, and we certainly won't want anybody touching our food. Uh, the very idea that another human who you don't know has actually laid hands on your food that you're putting in your mouth. That'll be too much to bear. We just simply won't do it. And then you can extrapolate that squeamishness to things like healthcare. Um, nobody is going to want a human to touch your body. It's like, you know, I'm just going to, you know, does this hurt? I'm going to feel you here and feel your body there. And it's like, what the hell? Get your hands off me. That's outrageous. And then surgery, nobody will opt for a human surgeon. They'll think, you know, maybe you were drinking this morning. Maybe you have a spasm in your hand and, you you know, you sever one of my major arteries, you know. I'd rather go for the, the, the robot that never makes a mistake. Ever, ever, ever. And who has a visual acuity a thousand times better than any human and never gets tired uh you know is is operates at the perfect temperature is totally um bug free doesn't have to scrub its hands you know it seems obvious to me that this is the road that we're going down and that road is going to take us all the way to transhumanism yes transhumanism so going back to the little history i have here it's a very short list um I don't know if you remember, but in 1999, do you remember the Sony Aibo? No. This was a little robot dog. 1999, it came out. And this little dog, it stood for, it's A-I-B-O, Artificial Intelligence Robot. And it was a little dog that cost like 1,500 pounds. Very expensive. It was very small. But it could play with a little ball. It could see it. And it could tap it and kick it and move around. It would walk around and you can play with it. It could sit up and it could beg. And when it got tired, when it started running out of battery charge, it would go to its charger and plug itself in. Absolutely amazing. I mean, this was astounding when it came out in the 90s. And it just got better and better and better over the next few years. And then Sony just canceled it for some reason. And I thought, wow. I mean, I wanted one. You know, it didn't poo, which was great. Um, you could turn it off. Uh, it could read emails to you. You know, I mean, you know, your 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 Bichon Friez isn't going to read your email to you. And I just thought it was fantastic—a little robotic pet. Because I think pets are important to a lot of people. You know, a lot of people need that um, interaction. They need companionship, and you know, animals and dogs fill that space quite nicely. But a robotic companion could be more engaging if you you look into the far future perhaps you know you can have everybody could have their own personal butler everybody could have a companion a robotic companion that either conspicuously walks about with you and you converse with this machine uh, or is available to you but is not conspicuous is maybe hiding in the crowd or hiding over there behind a building but is always watching you and always has your best interests at heart if you ever get into any trouble, it's there to help you. Um, if you need it to carry some bags, it'll carry your bags for you. It's just a robotic butler. You know, if you, if you need a, a, a pen, it's always carrying a pen. Um, if you need it, to, if you've just, you know, had an accident, it will grab you and take run you to the nearest hospital. That sort of thing. I think ro- robotic companion is coming. I think that's definitely going to come. And I thought the, the, the shape of things to come was in that Sony Aibo. I thought that's... That's that's a foreshadowing of this sort of social aspect of robotics. You know, it's providing a service like all robots, but that service that it's providing is companionship. And I think uh, that's also definitely coming along. 1999, the, uh, the Sony Aibo came out, which is a long, long, long time ago. It's very small, much smaller than you think. Um, in 2000, which again is a very long time ago, the Honda Asimo robot made its debut. This uh, ASIMO, A-S-I-M-O, Advanced Step in Innovative Mobility. So Honda is a company that makes all sorts of things, you know, lots and lots of different types of, uh, usually vehicles, but it makes lots of machines and, you know, it spends billions on research and development. And they built this fairly small but humanoid robot, the ASIMO, and it had its own battery pack and it was able to walk around. And over the sort of six, seven years that it was developed, um, it got to the point where it could run. 
a robot that could actually run on its own. So a bipedal robot, its own power source, not tethered to anything, was able to lift both of its feet off the ground in a run. It could climb stairs, it could shake your hand, it could do a little dance. You know, all very performance-based um, uh, tasks it could carry out. But nonetheless, it was very impressive, uh, you know, to see this thing was incredible. And, you know, it could, it could see, you know, it could, it could recognize shapes. So, you know, it did a lot of onboard processing. I don't know whether or not it did processing elsewhere. You know, maybe it was telemetry from its uh, optical sensors were being sent to a server farm or something. Like that. I don't know if that ever happened. But uh, certainly, again, it looked, it was the shape of the sort of robots you might think may become available. You know, it was friendly looking. It didn't look like the robot in that... Um, not Capricorn one. That was the film where. Yeah, not, that was the fake lunar landing film. There's another film. Oh, with O.J. Simpson. <laughs> That's the one. No, there's another film which had a really terrible, awful, horrifying um, robot. And I think Jane Fonda was in it. Maybe it wasn't. God, it's the tip of my mind. I'll have to put it. It's an show old notes. film. Yeah, it's an old film. Um, and it had a really, you know, a proper psycho um, robot in it that was didn't have a head. It just had a sort of. Little two little eye cones on a stalk, but it was humanoid otherwise. It was really scary and had lots of sharp bits on it and all the rest of it. So I guess, you know, it, it's when people think of robots, I guess they're going to think of Terminator and they're going to think of uh, um, the total enslavement of what's left of the human race after the singularity. But the companion, I mean, I really like the idea of a robotic companion. And I think the way that's going to start functionally will be exoskeletons. So they're now manufacturing robotic exoskeletons. So effectively, this is sort of like a robot that you get inside. So it starts off as just simple helping you lift heavy objects. So it's a sort of passive um, set of bars that are attached to you in some way. I mean, you can imagine something as simple as a couple of articulated bars that are connecting to your wrists and when you try and pick up something that's a little bit too heavy for you, it just assists a little bit with a servo. It just, it just makes heavy things a little bit lighter. Simple as that. But again, that's easy to extrapolate. Where do you go from there? I mean, you can you know just leap straight from that to Iron Man. Straight to the Aliens film, the end of that. Oh, the... Um, the, packing, the yellow thing uh, that yeah, she's the, in. The sort of uh, forklift... Uh, if you forklift exoskeleton I don't know what it's called. <laughs> yeah. a loading loading machine in some description and then to iron man and then to no more humans yes so then it's a, a dissolution of all of the uh weak human flesh uh, that's the next logical stop uh from there yes well that's the other thing that i kind of wanted to talk about and it's this is something that sam harris has kind of got me thinking about and this is uh where we're headed with artificial intelligence what was it that you wanted to say about this? You said something about, he spoke about this in his last podcast. Or um, it hasn't come to me, but uh, as far as artificial intelligence, I think the most interesting conversation about artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence, what that means is a sort of consciousness in a computational device. So it's a sort of a machine that could perhaps convince you that it is alive in terms of a consciousness. So there's the famous Turing test where you would sit down and have a conversation with a machine. And if it can, conv if you cannot tell whether or not it's, if it's a machine or a human, then it has passed the Turing test. So artificial intelligence is intelligent machines getting to the point where, you know, you have all the gains of computers. That is to say they have speed. They can perform massive calculations far greater than a human ever could. Uh, but also they have a sort of sense of a consciousness where they can make decisions autonomously. Um, and I think the, the most interesting discussion at the moment that I've heard is the, the ethical considerations for machines. Because if you have a car, a self-driving car, then it's going, it'll, it'll inevitably have to face moral or will make moral choices. And that morality presumably would need to be programmed into the machine. 
Um, so I think that's interesting. You know, how where are we going with artificial intelligence? And how are, are we moral enough to actually start designing artificially intelligent systems? No, that well, that's possibly what you're thinking of, because that's what Sam Harris is talking about with self-driving cars, about, you know, how to make a call about whether to kill this person or whether to kill that person if they have to, if, if they're veering do, off the road. Do you protect road. the driver who, who purchased the car or do you, you know, kill the person that, you know, if, if it's a choice between the driver and a pedestrian, who do you save? If one has to die, should it always be the driver in, in all circumstances? Or, you know, what's, what's the calculus? Mm. Well, speaking of that, I did actually put in the show notes the, um, the current accident rate for the Google cars. These are the Google self-driving cars. Yeah, so this is up to like the middle of 2015. Other drivers have hit uh, Google cars 14 times since the start of the project in 2009, including 11 rear-enders, and not once has the self-driving car been the cause of the collision. And so this is interesting because, you know, once there's the, well, once all cars can be self-driving, it would be completely irresponsible to choose to drive. So suddenly people who drive for fun, like me, could be arrested. Or, or, or at least vilified. Look at that psychopath driving that car. Exactly. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Putting all of our lives in danger. Yep. Well, that reminds me of two films. There is the part in Terminator 2 where one of the characters, I think it could be Linda Hamilton's character, um, she says... Or, or somebody is describing the Skynet and how Skynet uh, decided to kill all the humans. And they were talking about how the stealth bombers started flying themselves and as an experiment and then had a perfect record. Every mission was a total success and they never made a single mistake. So, you know, once you have a total success rate and it doesn't seem like it's going to change... Well, then, you know, suddenly you trust, you trust the system. And also there's another film. It's a Will Smith film called I, Robot, which is loosely based on Isaac Asimov's novel of the same name. And he takes manual control of the car. And I think the, his passenger is sort of aghast at this. <laughs> what, what are you doing? You're driving your car. And he's some sort of retro character in a, in a kind of demolition man sort of way and uh, you know he's really into the the 20th century which is ages ago now uh, uh yeah and you know just the the human reaction that you know somebody is has the capability to become so ne negligent as to not allow something that has a perfect operational record to always have control and that's just uh humans just uh delegating to the point where we're relegated and, uh, you know, we, we give up our own <laughs> sense of uh, free will. You know, we're, we're, we're becoming sheep. We, we just, you know, we defer absolutely everything over to the machines. I mean, I've already deferred uh, navigation to machines. I mean, I do not get paper maps out or plan car journeys, um, you know, look at the roads and check the traffic. And I don't do any of that. I, the, the computer does all of that. No, I, I, I still do that. No, because it's still unreliable many times. So I just double check to make sure. And there has been a couple of occasions where I've had to find an alternate route because the GPS has been less than reliable. Not to make this the Sam Harris show, but another thing that he was talking about when he's talking about artificial intelligence is how if we let go of the idea that our brains are magical, then there's no reason to think that computers won't sort of succeed us. Humans will be at the level of ants are to us, say, or, you know, termites or whatever, um, because machines will just grow and, and prosper at such an amazing rate and become godlike creatures of their own right. Well, you say they, but I, I see it in, I guess, evolutionary, faux evolutionary terms. They are us, right? The, the machines that will, I see, no doubt will succeed us. Well, well, they are. They are. Well, what I'm saying. They're just the that's next just evolutionary said. step. Well, no, you're saying you're saying they and they are going to become much better than we are, and we'll we will be like ants to them. No, we will. We are going to be amazing w w when we're completely robots and not yeah, human at exactly. all. Exactly. So I think I think there there, there's an evolutionary flavor to this, and I think no, I think that doesn't make any sense at all, Jeff. I think that's a weird kind of playing with words. It, they are they because we are completely organic, and they are machines. Well, no. Well, let me explain. I think what will happen, and this is the transhumanist argument. 
we are getting to the point where we are at peak human and the, the sorts of areas that we would like to further investigate are becoming off limits or, or are off limits to our the potential of our understanding because we're unable to comprehend reality any longer. So we're making new discoveries and these discoveries are getting so exotic and, and, and so out of our little primordial pool that we are simply unable to understand what's going on. And the only way we can continue our investigation in the universe and our place in it is to augment our uh, comprehension skills with technology. So already we're doing this. I mean, right now we're supplementing our memories by checking the internet. You know, um, what was that guy? Who was that guy in that movie? Well, you look it up on the internet now. So, you know, part of our brain is being supplemented by machines. But soon, I think we're going to start dismantling our biology and we'll start losing arms and legs in favor of having mechanical arms and legs. And this will happen for our brain as well. We'll have chips in our brains, which just, you know, have language, languages and uh, database archives of trivia and whatever. And we will slowly become machines. And I think that's the transhumanism. It'll get to a point where we've literally gotten rid of all of our biology and we have we have immersed ourselves into computers to expand our minds, to make ourselves immortal, and also expand our minds to the point where we are able to comprehend things like gravitational waves and, uh, you know, all of the phenomena in the universe. So that's what I mean by they are us and we are them. It's just an evolutionary change uh, of forced adaptation in order to understand the universe better and to achieve immortality, of course. So... For now, the utility of robots is what we're most interested uh, with. You know, what can robots do for us? Why march into battle when you can have robots doing it for you? So we've seen that. You know, we've seen an abstraction between humans and military operations, uh, especially from the West and the Americans operating drones and whatnot. But also supplementary robotics like uh remote surgery and um and uh uh remotely piloted vehicles and uh little remote control robots that can go into hazardous environments like the little machines that went into chernobyl uh all of that sort of thing extending our reach uh extending our understanding supplementing our understanding and um you know providing a, a utilitary service for us for now uh but ultimately i think we'll start um we'll, we'll start increasing the the prosthetics and the uh the augmentation i have the uh, uh isaac asimov's three robot laws here just pop them into the notes i think they're very interesting uh, i think they're very f limited uh, and i can think of a few a few uh, arguments around them but they sound good uh, number one a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Does so it make sense? Number two, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. So basically, you cannot command a robot to hurt somebody. Uh, but what if you wanted to do that? Um, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. So I think you would want fail-safes and um, safe words or safe gestures if, if you can't speak. Uh, definitely, I think there's a fear around robots and what they could be capable of with. Not just the singularity, which is when they achieve consciousness and they take control of the world and they see humans as the problem. But rather, you know, what if they go out of control? You know, if you're in an autonomous car, what if it just goes mental? What if there's an electromagnetic pulse or some other interference and uh, it just goes crazy and runs over a crowd of people? Or what if machines are hacked? You know, what if terrorists are able to control robots? Uh, then what? You know, if you had a robot humanoid robot walking in a crowd and it was taken over by a terrorist who could just remotely operate its its appendages, you know, perhaps it's metal, perhaps it's heavy, perhaps it's really strong, it could kill a whole bunch of people. So all of these are possibilities. So checks and balances need to be put in place. And, you know, safety first, we need to see what we can do in terms of uh, preventative 
treatment on uh, such systems and facilities. But uh, the repetitive jobs, I think that's that's what's going to go first. Uh, and I've seen some really amazing uh, robotic arms out there now. Ones that can, you know, uh, sort objects and then arrange them to be packed uh, really quickly, you know, almost faster than you can see. Uh, robotic arms that are able to catch objects that you throw at them. Uh, and, you know, they, they can work out how best to grasp the object coming at them. You know, in real time, you're literally throwing something at them and they're able to catch it in a non-destructive kind of way. Um, All of that blows my mind. I love seeing robots that can move really quickly or, you know, perform really complicated tasks quickly. I think that's fantastic. And I think, you know, we'll have robot entertainers. You know, why have human dancers when you can have robotic dancers who are, you know, capable of moving faster and doing insane things that no computer no, no human could ever do uh, you know i don't know i think you and i just have a kind of fundamental difference there when it comes to um that kind of thing because i don't know i, I quite like seeing humans i like seeing a human face yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm not saying <laughs> yeah but i'm not saying it's all or nothing you can no longer see humans anymore obviously i like seeing humans too well, but i would also but i would but i would also like to see a heck of a lot of automation you know, I don't want to see human street cleaners. I want to see robotic street cleaners. Okay. For instance. Yeah. And the people who, who used to be human street cleaners, we just want to see their bones on a big pile. Well, no, I'd just rather not ever see humans as street cleaners. <laughs> because I think that's it's such a, a menial, dispiriting task. I think it's it's a problem. And I think, you know, nobody nobody should do that. But it's but it's necessary for it to be done. So there, there's the uh, there's the problem. But the way I want to come at this is, you know, as I said at the start of the show, that some people feel that any job will give them a certain amount of self-esteem, sense of pride, and all that kind of thing. And you suddenly take away the only thing that these people can do. And I think that's a problem. Well, that that's your assumption. You're assuming that X is all something somebody can do. I think if you were to take away... Um, menial, repetitive, dispiriting job away from somebody and then say to them, look, all the time... Hang, yeah, on, you're, hang on, hang on. You're hang adding all those words. You're saying dispiriting. That person might not think they're That's dispiriting true, at all. But it is to me and it is to a lot of people. Put it this way. Let's let's take another example. Let's underground drivers. So the people who drive trains on the underground in London, right? These people are jeopardizing their health. They just are, because the air quality down there is terrible. It's bad news for your health to do, the, to do that, right? It really is. And they know this, but they, you know, they, t- they, they make their calculations and they take the risks. They know the risks. Uh, but nobody should be poisoning their bodies like that, really. I mean, come on. So take that job away. N- no longer make it a, a, a job that anybody can win. Give it to robots. And rather spend the time charitably. You know, inst- instead of driving this train, why not be, be, be a charity worker? You know, work, work to help other people. <laughs> people get a lot of fulfillment if they're helping somebody else. People get a lot of fulfillment providing a service, of course. But also helping people is fulfilling. There are lots of other fulfilling enterprises. I don't think there are people who only are fulfilled by... Jeff... I think that's a terrible example. In fact, this whole thought process of yours, I think, is pretty bad. Because I, I'm sure there are a lot of people who have a job and they feel that that's the job that they can do. You know, that's like their vocation. Being a train driver, it's like, that's all I want to do. I just want to be a train driver. And I think rather than say, oh, this you shouldn't be poisoning yourself, why not make it so that with all this amazing technology that driving a train, you're not poisoning yourself. They have some kind of air filtration that's piped into the cabins and they're, it's not a dangerous job. Because, because be that, a better because thing to do? That, no, because what that is, is that <laughs> that's just trying to dangerously stave off the inevitable. Because if somebody says, you know, all I've ever wanted to do is drive trains, And you say, well, okay, then Well, I'll try and, you know, make it as healthy as possible to do that for you. What you're doing is you're not reducing the risk of having a human driving a train full of a thousand people. 
That's what you're doing. You're putting other people's lives at risk by molly coddling somebody who thinks they can't do anything else. Uh, I don't think that's, that's entirely right. true because the trains. I mean, sorry, Mister Train Driver, for safety's sake, get another job. Okay, well, I think they're not really driving the trains anyway in the underground. I think the trains are largely automatic. I think they're just there as like a kind of fail-safe and maybe to talk to the people in the train occasionally. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not sure what all of their duties are, but for sure the air cold would be a hell of a lot better on the underground. And they're breathing it all day long and not seeing the sun and, you know, all the rest of it. I think they would agree that things could be better, even if it's just simply clearing the air quality. I can't imagine they're... The, the, the pay is pretty them, good to would be you, a, um... would you? Would you... Yeah, but you can pay them a million pounds a year. It, they're still breathing terrible quality air and, and damaging their yeah, health. Yeah, that's their right? choice. Fact. Yes, I know, I know it's their choice. But also there's the safety for passengers argument. Yeah, but the trains are so automatic. I, my, my point is, my point is, I think it's a mistake to try and artificially preserve human jobs when they could easily, to great benefit, be automated. I think this is a smashing the loom sort of argument. I think, uh, you know, things change, times change, technology is coming along at an insane pace. And unfortunately, an awful lot of jobs are going to go. But at the same time, a lot of other opportunities are going to open. Well, like? The argument could, the argument could be that the, 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 the openings and the new opportunities are not opportunities that are amenable to the people whose jobs were replaced. That is a problem. But, you know, we live in a, you know, a, a knowledge economy. It's, it's, that's just the way it is. You know, it's, it no longer matters how quickly you can stack boxes. It now matters how quickly you can make decisions and think and program and work complicated systems. And it's just, that's life. It changes. It's, it's called advancement. And I think, uh, nobody should be getting in the way of automation. And I think ultimately it will, the, the tide will lift all boats. And I think everybody will have a better life when, you know, we have more robots on the scene. Driving down prices, increasing competition, increasing safety. It just sounds insane because, I mean, I agree. You know, I don't like the idea of people standing in the way of such obviously wonderful technology. Although, not to keep going back to Sam Harris, but he has a he has articulated very well a very um, a very possible problem with computers becoming so smart that they feel like they don't need humans to slow them down anymore, and what that actually means for humankind. But We've already kind of touched on that. But it seems like there really will be a significant portion of people on Earth who are no longer just needed for their jobs. And because there's more and more people generally, you know, populations are all going up. It's like, well, what do we do? What, what do we do here? We're going to have too many humans. Do we cull? Is, is there a cull? Well, I think, I think, there's, I think there's research, which I, we don't have here, but I'll try and ferret it out and put it in the notes, to suggest that we're not going to have this massive population boom, and that's a fantasy. Research from what where? Will happen? Where did you find that? I will find it. I don't have it, so I, I, but I will find right. it. That We're not heading towards 100 billion people on Earth or anything of the sort. It will level what? out. And all, yes. Why, you, why just, are you saying just, that? Just assume that I have seen this research. I will subsequently find it. But just go along with me here. So I think the whole, there's going to be a massive, huge explosion of people and it's all going to be soylent green and uh, nobody will have a job and all that sort of doom and gloom uh, scenario, I think is overplayed. And I think what will happen is that people will have fewer children. They will have fewer children because the more technologically sophisticated people get, <laughs> the more... Um, the, the better access they have to information. And this is a fact. They tend to have fewer children. That's why in the, in the West, generally speaking, people have far fewer children than people in, in, the, in the, the Middle East and the, the East. Uh, because of all this, you know, the, the, the availability of information and the, 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 the understanding of heightened um, standards of living and all the rest of it, people just generally slow down on the whole kids front. They don't have such large families. And certainly the more um, unbelieving and generally non-religious and culturally non-religious people become, they have fewer children as well. So you have the whole Catholic phenomenon, you know, when people fly away from Catholicism generation after generation, they have fewer children, whereas full-blown Catholics typically, typically have many children. Um, so I think 
once you just reduce the number of, I mean, if you were just to reduce the number of employment opportunities and you didn't have a massive welfare state, I think fewer people would be flooding into other countries for economic um, opportunities. And I think people will ultimately have fewer children. So, and, and all the, all the children that there will be, there will be more facilities to support them anyway, because prices would drop. Um, more people would have more time to spend on charitable programs. So I think, you know, people, there aren't going to be bones in the street from people who are unable to work. I think rather there will be more safety nets for people who are unable to gain employment. And there'll be more opportunities for people to do other things that benefit society in general. That doesn't that necessarily need, that need to be a sort of standard, traditional structured employment uh, position. That's what I think. We'll adapt. We'll adapt. We shouldn't stand in the way of progress. Robotics are coming in a big way. Um, and we just have to get used to it. I mean, it may be a hundred years before we walk shoulder to shoulder with, uh, you know, um, humanoid bipedal robots uh but i think that'll happen as well i think it's just inevitable so you know just just from my experience of seeing things like uh the little drones um and how quickly they've come along and mobile phones you know these <laughs> these super computers we have in our pockets that didn't exist 10 years ago uh it's insane absolutely insane and uh, and now they're making uh, prosthetic limbs that are which i think you know it's, so fabulous i'm so happy whenever i see major advancements in prosthetics and now they have you know robotic prosthetic hands uh just today uh, i saw a report on a a robotic hand that had been cast from a 3d print of a uh, human skeleton and it has all the same tendons and all the same places and motors where the muscles normally are and it's it's really really mimicking the human hand and it has a level of dexterity that is, you know, far surpasses anything that has come before. And I think that's fantastic. I mean, who wouldn't want to have a, a, a Luke Skywalker style prosthetic hand you know, should they lose their, their natural hand? Uh, and again, it'll get to a point where people will opt to have robotic prosthetics rather than have their normal limbs and legs and things just to give them, you know, advantages and whatever pursuit they're into. Climbers, perhaps, you know, climber might want, might want longer fingers. So transhumanism, really, uh, again, um, we've covered technological unemployment, I believe. Uh, rights, we haven't covered. So, that, you know, should, I guess this is an artificial intelligence uh, dilemma. Uh, will computer brains um, get to the point where not only can we not determine whether we, we no longer tell the difference between a human and a computer, uh, will that imbue the computers with rights of some description? You know, might they have rights? Might their testimony in a trial be worthy? Or, you know, sh should they have rights? I think that's something it'll inevitably come up. I mean, it's, it's been covered hugely in science fiction, but uh, I think... That is a real, a real uh, area of uh, investigation. Uh, biomechanical hybridization, we've covered that as well. So people basically opting for um, robotic prosthetics and then gradually becoming a robot and then maybe dissolving our consciousnesses into some sort of computer program. And then interstellar travel. So, you know, we, we live on the Earth and uh, we've always lived on the Earth. Everybody who has ever lived, the Earth. Uh, nobody's ever gone anywhere else, really. Uh, but that can't continue forever. Uh, ultimately, we're going to have to, or something's going to have to get the hell off this planet before it gets hit by another rock. Uh, but, you know, the distances we're talking about is immense. Just to get to our local planets and our solar system is crazy, crazy distances. And it doesn't seem to be anything really that hospitable in our solar system. We'd have to do serious engineering in order to make anything habitable. We're talking, you know, moon-sized shopping malls. Um, so interstellar travel, if we were ever to leave our solar system and head to another star, uh, with conventional propulsion systems, Assuming we haven't discovered anything else like wormholes or or gravitational waves. 
uh, we're talking tens of thousands of years to get to any other star. Uh, so to do that, perhaps we need to just completely let go of our biology and give it all over to the robots, either just kill ourselves off and let the robots go off on, ourself, uh, um, on their own or preserve our bodies in some way, hoping that the robots will be able to develop technology to revive us in the tens of thousands of years it takes to get to another planet or, uh, or some sort of hybrid uh, of the two. But uh, ultimately, I think we're going to have to try and get to another star and it's going to take an awful long time. And uh, that's where either we're going to have to be robots or we're going to have to completely put all of our eggs in the robotic realm, as it were. Um, just the final section in the notes here, the arts. So the things that the movies, mostly, that pop into my mind when I think about robots are, of course, The Terminator, which I thought was great, and I was a big fan of Terminator 1 when it came out, and I had waited ages for Terminator 2. Uh, AI, which I think we've spoken about in a previous podcast, which was had some Stanley Kubrick involvement there, but uh, was all about... It was a Pinocchio story, basically, about um, uh, redemption and um, love. Uh, Metropolis, uh, which was a... Very forward-looking film from the 20s, Metropolis, I forget. Blade Runner, um, another classic sort of robot film. Uh, great in that it was a cheap robot film. The robots were completely human, so there was no special effects required, which was great. But it, it, you didn't need it. It reminded me of uh, uh, Battlestar Galactica, which is also on the list here. The reimagined reboot Battlestar Galactica from a few years ago. Uh, they didn't have the budget for robots, so they made them completely biological. And not only that, they were indistinguishable from humans. You literally couldn't tell a robot from a human. And uh, I think, you know, that sort of thing is in our future as well. Star Wars, of course, which has lots of robots, uh, cutesy pie robots mostly, um, but uh, very anthropomorphized. Even the little dustbin-shaped one was uh, obviously human. Um, iRobot, which I've mentioned, this was the Will Smith film from a few years ago, which I, I enjoyed. I thought it was very good. I thought the, the humanoid robots were very well realized. Uh, you know, they were friendly, they were super mega capable, and they were mass produced, and they went bad. Uh, Bicentennial Man. So this is a, a novel by Isaac Asimov, I believe, which was also a Robin Williams film from I don't know, 20 years ago and uh, this is where it's uh, a robot that has a consciousness uh, and is alive uh, but wants to be a real boy uh, another Pinocchio story I guess um, The Matrix which is sort of a, a sort of um, inverse robotics story in that it's all it happens inside a robot uh, so it's all computer programs and uh, really excellent. Um, the Mechanical. This was a novel I read a few a year ago, maybe. Uh, very good. I forget who the author is. I'll put it in the notes. But uh, again, it's about a, a race of enslaved robots who are seeking um, emancipation. Um, and of course, 2001 and HAL 9000. So this was the first really good depiction of a machine making moral and ethical decisions and facing quandaries. Uh, I thought that was superb. Any uh, any robot movies pop into your brain? Robbie the Robot? Well, unless there's anything else, I know there's a huge amount of uh, areas that we've failed to address here, so I apologize for that. Maybe we'll revisit it. But... Um, you have been listening to Eclecticist. Uh, we have a webpage, eclecticist.co.uk. Pop along for the latest um, show topics. Uh, also, the show notes, all the previous topics, and a contact form at the bottom. If you fill that out, you can tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Um, we don't know what the next show will be, so if you do have an idea, pop it in the notes uh, section at the bottom of the webpage. The music this time around to play out with is, again, open source, uh, so we don't get sued. It is called You Were My Robot Lover. It's by Quiet Music for Tiny Robots. 
It's available under an attribution license. It's uh, very beepity beep, but actually really good sort of electro pop synth. And uh, I thought it was quite good. I might actually uh, download the whole album. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Good evening. Robots, I used to know the code to make you.